we're going to be talking about Drupal 8 plugin system. Um, a few people here. <coughs> How many have actually worked in Drupal 8, like dabbled with the code and maybe updated their modules? Awesome. So hopefully a lot of this will be familiar with you, and I'll be exposing some internal information that might help you out. And if not, um, maybe it'll be too much information and confuse a lot of Like this? Oh, God, it's so awkward. I have to, like, lean forward. All right. I'll do my best. Cool. So um, this is me. I'm Heller. If you guys haven't uh, met me before. Um, I've been working in Drupal for maybe about five or six years. Uh, I currently work at NBC Universal, and uh, my handler is uh, pretty easy, uh, Hellier, at uh, most uh, social media sites and Drupal as well. Um, I haven't actually contributed anything meaningful to Drupal 8. I just kind of dabbled in it um, maybe a couple months ago, and in my findings, so that was some pretty cool stuff to share with you. Um, but it is uh, fairly technical, I guess, uh, just by its nature. Um, plugins are itself just PHP classes, and so there's a lot of dry technical information involved in there. So just a fair bit of warning. Um, when I prepared these slides, I, I had in mind that uh, everyone here is very uh, nerdy and uh, can handle a lot of the PHP talk. So if anything, that is the disclaimer here. Um, and the prerequisite, that uh, hopefully you guys understand at least the basics of object-oriented PHP and, uh, and PHP 5. Um, so yeah, just drop in a quick overview so you guys know what to expect here. Um, I'll explain what plugins are, at least in the scope of Drupal 8. Um, and uh, I'll talk about why it's so important uh, to uh, discuss the just the conversation of why creating plugins as opposed to just creating custom uh, hooks or just going to town with, uh, with whatever kind of mechanism. Uh, why it's all important and what the benefits are. And uh, also, I'll drop in and talk about some critical Drupal 8 concepts that are uh, in itself requirements to um, understand the plugin system. Uh, a quick preview to that is uh, I'll be talking about PSR4, uh, annotations, uh, service containers, and uh, dependency injection. Um, and after we get through with that, I'll do a quick little demo of what it is to actually write some plugins. Um, and I'll dabble in with a few different uh, plugin systems um, and show you some other concepts that are baked into what it is to define plugins and then create derivations of them, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then the most important part. Um, well, if, if you don't intend on uh, creating your own plugin system, um, maybe you can drop off at that point after step four. Um, but step five here in this case is uh, going to be talking about the internals of the plugin system, um, how it actually works uh, internally, uh, what are the classes that are used uh, to bake together uh, the discoverability of plugins, um, what we're using to map certain instances to this or that, and uh, how to basically uh, set up your own thing from the ground up. Um, and I'll do um, uh, another demo of uh, creating your own plugin type. Now. Um, the thing with creating plugin types, you see a lot of them in Drupal, and they're usually wrapped around uh, user interfaces, and uh, those are baked in with configuration entities. Um, and it's very similar to, uh, to config bags and then also just having plugins on the side. So it's kind of confusing. The lines are pretty thin. So I try my best to avoid talking about configuration entities because they will get confusing, and they're basically a talk within themselves. Um, but I'll create a plugin type, um, and it's going to be basically headless, and you'll see a few lines of code there of how to uh, define your plugin type, where to discover other plugins that are implemented, and then how to actually use it. Um, but the business logic that you decide to do uh, with them, the I guess the business logic system itself, that would be an exercise for you guys to, to do on your end. So moving on, what is a plugin? Um, the way I define plugins, at least within the scope of Drupal 8, is a discrete class that executes an operation within the context of a given scope as a means to extend Drupal's functionality. <coughs> so we think of extending Drupal's functionality in many ways with, hey, I'm going to invoke a hook, or I'm going to implement a hook. Can you talk into the mic, please? Sorry. And speak louder. Sorry. <laughs> So yeah, a plugin is a discrete class that executes an operation within the context of a given scope. Um, when I say within a given scope, um, there's always the evils of uh, within Drupal. There's there's anything you can do in almost any um, place, and uh, that can have some uh, confusion with you know developers that are not really sure with where to put in their code. So oftentimes you put in some uh, some crazy stuff inside of like hook init or a hook page build or whatnot, 
Uh, but the idea with the plugin is that um, it kind of enforces the best practice of only doing a thing within a small scope, uh, maybe within a method, um, and you're only given a certain amount of parameters to work with. And if there's anything else that's outside of that, a global, um, for instance, uh, you might start to feel a little uncomfortable with doing that because now you're pulling in um, objects out of thin air and you start to feel kind of a strange, cringy feeling. Uh, but within plugins, just the whole uh, good behavior here, or the best practice is that you have limited scope and uh, limited to what you could actually do. Um, and moving on to that, uh, plugins themselves, they should really only do one thing and do it well. Um, kind of like a Unix philosophy where you have one utility that just does this one operation, gets a simple input, sends out simple output, and that's it. And it sends it off to the next thing that does its job really well. Um, you should kind of treat plugins in such a way as well, where you're not trying to achieve too much within some sort of an implementation or you, know, you have all your logic within a method as if it was a controller um, that has a lot of uh, application-specific stuff. A uh, plugin should be abstracted. A uh, plugin should be something that can take in configuration and then do stuff with it, but not too much. And then also, I mean, since you can pass in, um, you know, plugins, or you can pass in configurations within plugins, um, you have this idea of every instance could have different config, it could have different states, and regardless of what the states are, um, the plugin can handle the operations uh, within them, um, and so you have a sense of reusability. Um, and you can have a single class that you've created, a single plugin, and you reuse it across different uh, places on a site, or even better, reuse it across different sites within all of your projects. Because you're just passing in different configurations to do things with it. So, yeah. I'm kind of a visual guy. So I like to see what plugins are, at least uh, in a practical sense, where you've seen them. So I'll show you a few screenshots of a Drupal 8 interface to kind of get you familiar with, uh, with what plugins are and how you could identify them. And keep in mind those three principles about plugins, that they're instantiable, configurable, reusable, they do one thing, one thing well, and that they're limited within scope. So here you see um, the blocks UI, where everything on the right well is essentially a, a, an instance of a plugin, search form, user login. Each one of these are implementing a block type or just a block in itself. Um, in Drupal 8, you can configure these and instantiate them. It's not like Drupal 7 where you can only use one block per region. Um, you can pull these in and add state to them, uh, basically adding <coughs> configurations to it. Um, and they're very narrow in scope. Right? You're only supposed to have content within a single block. Another example of plugins are field types themselves. Um, field types prior to, the, uh, to Drupal 8 were implemented by several different hooks, um, but still conceptually it's supposed to be a single thing. You're describing a schema validation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and each one of these uh, plugins or you know, field types can be used across different sites. It's not like it's application specific. Um, likewise with field widgets and field formatters. <coughs> actions themselves. So take for account a limited scope. Each one of these actions are supposed to be expecting just a single user or just a single node, right? And it's only supposed to operate one single thing. So again, it's uh, small in scope, it does one thing and one thing well, and can be used across uh, different projects. And here we have image effects, also implemented as plugins. Input filters, right? They process text, and they do a very specific thing, and they pass it on to the next input filter. Um, and this is kind of similar to input formats. However, input formats are configuration bags, a uh, configuration entity which basically houses all the configuration that you would pass into input filters. Um, so that itself is kind of like a container, uh, but the input filter itself is the plugin in which it uses to process some text. And now in Drupal 8 we have a CKE editor, or CK editor buttons. So each one of those are implemented as plugins. And entity types, et cetera, et cetera. So you see that plugins are everywhere. Um, and uh, if you can see this with your binoculars, you can see that there's a lot of plugins in Drupal 8, and uh, you have a little bubble off into the top left. Those are actually view plugins. So since they're baked in as classes, um, your plugin types can be extended and build other sub-plugin types uh, with them. So you'd be familiar with all the different views plugins that are available. That's essentially it. Um, and almost everything here that you see uh, in Drupal 8 interfaces are baked in as plugins. And you might be uh, thinking to yourself, all this seems really, really familiar to me. Um, and, uh, and rightly so. Uh, a lot of these in the past have been implemented before with some sort of a info hook, um, hook whatever info 
Um, but now, essentially, that has been deprecated for the most part in Drupal 8. Um, and we have different means of discovering uh, these different instances, discovering these different plugins. Um, and that's all thanks to the plugin system. Um, so, yeah. So, before we move on to the actual how to create plugins, I'll basically talk about the benefits of them. One thing I really like about Drupal 8 is uh, that the definition of a plugin and the implementation are all baked in together. Um, if you had ever implemented a block, you know that you have to have a hook block info, and then a hook block view, and then a hook block, et cetera, et cetera, and all these different procedural functions to describe this one thing. Um, and it gets kind of hairy, and um, it's a little more difficult to work with, especially if you're providing more blocks within those hooks, because then you have to do switch cases, and it gets pretty ugly. But in Drupal 8, uh, since every plugin is defined as a, as a class, uh, we can use actually uh, annotations to describe and you know declare what uh, each one of our plugin types do uh, without having to have a mess of code all over the place. So I'll talk more about annotations and why they're so cool. Secondly, uh, plugins are lazy loaded. And this is one thing I never really liked is that if I had to do some sort of a operation or needed to have some globally accessible service or, or, or whatnot, I would have to include it inside of the module file. And that made me feel uncomfortable because uh, that's a lot of PHP code that gets cached in and has to get loaded up. But as far as Drupal 8 is concerned, uh, your plugins won't exist. It'll know about them as far as where the definitions are and where to find it, but it won't actually load the code until it actually uses it. So they are lazy loaded. And the more plugins you add in, there's no performance cost at all because they're just dormant in your code, which is really cool. And also code is unified. Um, I mentioned already the uh, hook block uh, info and hook block whatever. Um, the fields uh, were also a, a huge uh, pain in that sense. Whenever you wanted to create a, a field type or a field widget or a field formatter, you'd have to write seven or eight different plugins to describe just this one thing. And again, if your module provided multiple types of these, you'd have to you know mess with cases, switch cases. And so that gets kind of hairy as well. But in this case, all the code is unified inside PHP uh, class methods. Um, so you don't have that, that, that separation, and you don't have to do weird stuff to pass in state across all of these different uh, uh, methods or all these different hooks that you would uh, apply. And just by uh, the fact that plugins are, ex are implemented as classes, um, you get the, the, the object-oriented aspect of it where all your, 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 your plugins are extendable. Um, I like some of the, the widgets and the field types that are provided by Drupal Core. But it's really difficult to say, I like these, this image type or this image widget, but I would like to add just one little thing to it. It's not a, a thing to just extend it and apply your own button to it or apply an extra validation to it. You literally have to re-implement the entire field type or re-implement the entire widget and pass in all the different uh, validation and all the different hooks, and it's, it's just god awful. But with Drupal 8, you could extend that class and just provide in your own extra uh, things with it and uh, still get the benefit of all the existing validation um, and all the existing you know formatters that exist for it so there's a big one there uh, with reusability um, because of course they are classes and also because they're PHP classes we can now leverage uh, interfaces uh, where we can say hey you know this plugin type that's provided uh, is supposed to implement said number of methods and that's a contract essentially so if you have any kind of plugin that are uh, implementing a plugin type, you can rest assured that they're going to have the methods that are promised within the interfaces. So there's no guessing of like, hey, you know, does this plugin support this operation? Do I have to check for this if method exists? Um, it's going to be there. So um, a little bit of developer love there. That's a great thing. And uh, because everything is using uh, similar interfaces, uh, this implies the fact that you can actually swap these classes around because they all you know, basically provide the same inputs and they give out the same outputs. They have the unified interface. So what's to keep us from actually swapping out these operations? So uh, yeah, plugins are now swappable and uh, you can uh, move them around and uh, interchangeably. So that's a great thing. And reusable across different projects. This is very true because of course, all of this logic is baked into plugins and shouldn't necessarily be tied into application logic. Um, you can use them within different uh, sites. You know, it doesn't have uh, application logic baked into them. If anything, you'd be passing in configurations to them. And uh, I feel that the plugin system kind of enforces or encourages that kind of pattern. Um, so kudos to you. Um, but you could have always done this in Drupal 7 and in some cases in Drupal 6 as well. 
um, using ctools. Actually, uh, I was very involved with ctools um, and uh, just its mechanics with uh, having plugins and uh, you know having classes as, as ways of implementing these plugins. And of course, um, if you're careful with the way you're implementing these things, you could always you know capture these these plugin types into your own custom module that can be reused across different sites uh, in your team or even uh, within just different projects. Um, and basically passing in the configuration state into these plugins to do different stuff. So moving on, uh, core concepts that are baked into Drupal 8 that are kind of a necessity to understand um, when we're looking into how to implement these plugins. So we're talking about dependency injection, uh, service containers, annotations, and TSR4. I was in an assumption at first that I had to learn Symfony uh, in order to understand Drupal 8. And so I spent some time in there for a while and realized there's a lot of stuff in here that's not necessarily applicable. Um, it's really good stuff to know, but um, it boils down to really these four concepts that are required. And then everything else just kind of becomes Drupalisms that are using these concepts as helpers. Um, so the first one we'll talk about is PSR 4, which is an auto-loading standard. If you're not already familiar with what PSR is, it's a PHP specification request. Um, essentially, uh, representatives of all the PHP frameworks uh, get together and uh, they discuss what are some patterns that we can use across the board where we can uh, work interoperably and uh, you know um, foster these standards. Um, PSR0 was the first auto-loading standard um, and up to maybe a week ago, I think uh, Drupal 8 converted uh, at least all the module code into using PSR4. Um, what that is, is basically a way for autoloaders to know where to find your classes, so there has to be some sort of a structure in which everything follows. Um, part one of this is having a fully qualified namespace, and it should be in the format of your vendor namespace, and then a sub -nam namespace, and then finally the class name. And secondly, your directory structure is supposed to match at least the sub namespace for this plugin. So given an example, say we have a class called myBlock, and uh, the fully qualified namespace for this is Drupal, my module, plugin, block, my block. And uh, within this class name, it's just called my block, but it's encapsulated within the namespace of Drupal, my module, plugin, block. Uh, previously in the Drupal 7 and below, uh, we had to prefix all of our classes and all of our modules with the module name, and that worked out pretty well. Um, it prevented namespace clashes, but this is a much more elegant way of achieving the same thing. Um, so, given this class, how can the autoloader find it? Um, it depends on where you put it. So here would be the directory structure that's uh, baked into it. Within your modules directory, here, my module exists, and you have a source directory. And in there, that's where the subname space is kind of mapped with the directory structure there. So we have plugin, block, and finally, myblock.php. Um, there's different variants of this, and of course there's a lot more explanation to this. I have a couple links at the bottom. Uh, for uh, phpfig.org, uh, and you can see all the different PSRs, uh, specifically this PSR4, which uh, describes it. Um, and more germane to Drupal, actually, is another link um, that talks about how Drupal uses it, um, all the pros and cons, and possibly links to uh, other issues where there's a lot of drama and why we should or shouldn't use it at all. Um, and also, as a reminder, uh, we have Sprint on Friday, so uh, there's a lot of issues in the plugin system, about two pages full. So if you want to jump in, hey, follow Drupal Mentoring on Twitter. Uh, check out austin2014.drupal.org slash sprints and see what you can do to help out. <coughs> Make this all possible for everyone. Anyway, annotations. Um, so annotations is essentially just metadata inside of doc blocks. Um, and a lot of people call doc blocks just multi-line uh, comments. Um, but actually, they're not. A regular comment is, in a sense, a, a single line comment, so you have your double slashes in front, and so that's cool. Uh, and that's actually ignored by Ops Code Cache. And we could also have multi-line comments with the, you know, the, the forward slash and splat. Um, but again, that's still ignored by Ops Code Cache. Um, but sometime around, uh, I think PHP 5.1, um, a reflector class had the ability to actually uh, uh, introspect and, and read its own doc blocks, uh, which is what we have uh, to describe a lot of our functions. And so that kind of opens up the ability uh, to have something that's parsable inside of the doc blocks and pull things in. And you've seen this a lot before, uh, these markers where you have an at symbol, so like at deprecated, at to do, at param, at return, uh, those are all markers. Uh, now with the PHP 5.1, with the reflector class, we can actually read those in and parse them. And uh, essentially that's what annotations are. Not necessarily code, um, 
uh, it is just basically uh, d declaring certain values. So you're parameterizing your markers. Um, and this is a custom uh, uh, marker, um, so at my plugin name, and I can pass an arbitrary list of, uh, of values and, uh, and keys. Um, and so yeah, the annotations can find that within the code, and uh, this is essentially how a lot of the classes can define themselves. You don't have to have a separate info hook. You can just have that all baked into the comments. So very easy, very simple. Um, there's a very interesting slide deck. I um, have a, share, uh, a link at the bottom on slideshare.net that describes uh, the history of annotations, all the different annotation engines that exist in PHP. <coughs> um, and uh, why they're so cool. So yeah, that's it, annotations. Moving on to a dependency injection. Um, what, you know, people describe this as an inversion of control, and I really didn't get what that meant for a long time. Um, so here's an example, and this is actually a, a problem that I struggled with for a while uh, with some of my own previous projects. Uh, say I have a class named some class, and inside of the constructor, I'm using another class um, to kind of help me do some stuff, and so inside of the constructor, I initialize a handler. So this handler is a new handler. Uh, and so there you go. I instantiate my sum class, and then inside of it, it does some stuff with this handler. Um, but say, for whatever reason, someone else needs to use this sum class and extend it and do some other stuff. And within extending it, uh, they need to modify the handler that's instantiated. Uh, but the problem is, is that this handler is actually instantiated in a, a lot of different places within this class. And so now, in order for them to do a simple extension, they have to look for all the different methods that are instantiating these classes, override those, and implement their own or instantiate their own handler. Um, and this gets very frustrating and very difficult to, uh, to, to basically manage. Um, the inversion of control here is basically described that the calling user is instead defining what the dependencies are. So in my sum class, if I had written in such way where in the constructor, I'm just accepting the handler object, and then I just simply assign it within, then that means that the calling user can just invoke their own or uh, uh, instantiate their own handler and pass that into my sum class. So now who has control? It's not my class anymore, it's the developer. So that's all of what dependency injection is in a nut. There's nothing more to it. Um, and there's a link uh, posted at the bottom that kind of describes this um, with using uh, better examples. Um, uh, but yeah, that's essentially what dependency injection is. If uh, this ever confused you, now you know. Moving on to this though, is something called service containers. Um, service containers, they do something pretty cool where they auto instantiate these classes for you, um, but they have to be service oriented, implying that they don't have states, they don't have configuration baked in. They're just classes that do things, and they do things in a global scope. Um, and the thing with service containers is that you can register uh, all the dependent classes within them. So for instance, um, the example that we had with the handler and the sum class, um, you would basically set up like this, handler equals new handler, instance equals some class of whatever, passing in the handler into that. Um, but instead of having to provide all the classes that are dependents, because keep in mind, new handler probably had dependencies of its own. And those classes that it depends on probably had dependencies of its own. So you could imagine you would have to instantiate a lot of classes and pass them all in uh, until you could actually have the instance that you want. So the idea here is that within service containers, we can define what those dependencies are. So in my case with the sum class, um, inside of my module.services.yaml file is where I can basically describe my service. And I'm providing a machine name, my module.sum class, and I'm defining where the class can be found, what the namespace is, and I'm passing in the arguments. And my arguments are pointing to something called at handler, which is the machine name of the dependent service container. And the thing with this is that somewhere out there, there is a handler service that's being described that it will in turn describe its own dependencies and it's just like daisy chaining across the board. And when I want to instantiate um, a, a sum class, all I have to do now is say, Drupal, give me the service, my module dot sum class, and it will go ahead and do the instantiation for me. In fact, reading off the services files, um, Drupal will generate PHP code that has all this all these instantiators inside of an array. Uh, so it's pretty tricky how it does it. It's pretty cool, actually. Um, and there's a link uh, at the bottom, uh, basically uh, uh, talking about Pimple, which is a, a library <coughs> of PHP that does the service container stuff. And it kind of talks about like how the mechanisms are, like what, what it's actually doing internally. Um, but yeah, so instead of you having to instantiate all your classes 
on your own. You can just register them and then call it in um, at the very end using Drupal.services. And this is okay because defining what classes you're going to depend on isn't necessarily a runtime decision. It's something that you can have baked in and registered. And if you ever had to have the same class but have different dependencies, you can just register another service itself. Um, so yeah, that's how you can instantiate things with service containers. Pretty cool. So quick review. Talk about what plugins are, um, basically what their benefits of using them, and uh, what the uh, the use cases are for having the different instan uh, instances, configurations, and whatnot. Um, brief through some of the core concepts using Drupal 8, and now it's time for some demos. So we've been looking at some source code. Swapping it out. Oh. This sucks. Let me mirror this real quick. Alrighty, so um, here I have a, a demo module called Pilot. And uh, as we mentioned before, uh, per uh, PSR4, we have all of our plugin implementations or all of our classes, so uh, basically the autoloaders can find them inside of the source directory. Um, you notice inside of the module, I don't have any info hooks at all. And everything is just found within source, plugin directory, and then all the different plugin types that are out there. So. What differentiates a class from a plugin? Essentially, it's a class that's within a certain namespace and that implements a specific uh, interface. So I'll start off with uh, the image effects um, plugin type. So this is what's desaturating or resizing your images. Um, and we have something called pixelize. So first off, it's inside of the directory source plugin image effect and then my plugin name is called pixelize. So therefore there's my class. It's extending the image effect base, which is implementing configurable image effect interface, which just means that, hey, I have this image effect, but I also have a way of uh, basically defining configurations for it. So that means I can implement stuff like default configuration and get form and validate form, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, what's very important is that I'm defining this class within a certain namespace. Is that large enough, by the way? No, it should be bigger. Let's guess bigger. Uh huh. It's on GitHub. I'll post a link to it on the comments of the talk. So yeah, the namespace is Drupal Pilot. So that's the vendor namespace. The sub namespace would be Plugin Image Effect because that's what the image module defined it to be. Um, for every class that I use, I have to go ahead and say, hey, use this one, so that way I can, uh, you know, it's basically a shortcut. So again, I'm assuming PHP uh, uh, experience with you guys. And the uh, info hook that would have been is actually now within an annotation. Sure, I have my description, but the most important part is I have an at image effect marker that describes, hey, this is my identifier, this is my ID, pilot pixelize, and this is the label that I want. And we're even using a translation marker that says this string right here is translatable, so pass it through the T function, do your thing. So ID, label, description, bam. And just with this, I should have it available in the UI. Uh, of course, the, uh, the thing is with the contract that I'm implementing a specific interface, I have to provide the apply effect. And uh, I, could, uh, I could have extended something uh, like a desaturate or re resize and uh, do some additional stuff to it. Um, but this is just uh, extending off the image effect base, which essentially does nothing. Um, in here, I'm just going to be pixelizing an image. Um, and I'm saying, uh, how much do I want to pixelize it by? And do I want to use advanced controls for this pixelization? And here is a quick uh, form API insertion. So we have get form. So that's essentially it, and I will show you what that looks like in the UI. So we have the image style. Let's add a style. Call that blah. 
Um, because I have this uh, information inside of the annotation, I should be able to see it here, pixelized. Awesome, so let's add this. Since I'm implementing uh, the configurable, what was it? Configurable image effect interface, I have the opportunity to add in a form. So say pixel size uh, 40 would be fine. Uh, I don't want to use advanced pixelization, uh, pixelization effects. Go ahead and add it. Boom, so that's saved into a config entity. And let's go over to the uh, article display image and say we're going to, uh, going to use that image effect. Blogs in there, go ahead and update that, and then save, and let's add some content. Some article content to be exact. Stuffs, adding an image. Um, Super Mario. So, this Super Mario image is actually a very realistic rendition of Mario, where Yoshi is a dinosaur, and uh, Mario is a, a pudgy fat guy. Um, let's go ahead and save and publish this and see what it looks like through our pixelization. Hey, it's what we're used to. Pixelized Mario. Uh, pretty cool, huh? Uh, and all I had to do is apply effect method, essentially. And this is all contained within a single file. So no hooks elsewhere. It's not cluttering up any of the module file. It's just, just by fiat, just because it exists inside this namespace, it will be picked up. <coughs> so this is a, essentially a simple plugin that just does this one thing. However, uh, if you guys are familiar with, uh, with C tools, uh, there was an opportunity to create child's plugins. Uh, for instance, there was one class or one plugin type that uh, handled all of the blocks. Or there was one plugin type that handled all of the relationships between entities. But it had a mechanism to basically look through everything inside of the schema, find relationships between things, and it can create spawn child plugins based on what it found through some sort of a traversable set of data. And so now we have child plugins, and there's several of them, with their own instances. However, it's still using one single class to do all the operation. In Drupal 8, we call that derivations, or derivatives. Um, so uh, I have another image effect called colorize. Um, and this is uh, super simple. I'm basically just applying a, a, a tint uh, based off a list of uh, colors that I had defined prior. So say, for instance, uh, and I'll jump into the module file. Um, here's an array of uh, colors. So I have lime and hot pink. Um, imagine if this was a configuration that you built yourself, where you can just add another, add another color. Um, and then with that data, our plugin for colorization can just basically pull that in and uh, apply the effect that you provide it with the state. Right? Um, so the thing that defines this plugin from being a derivative is that we have a derivative right here uh, parameter in which we're defining where our class is to do the derivatives itself. Um, and that can be found inside a plugin derivative. And this is what's basically, it's a glorified for each. And for each one of the data that we have stored in the database, or as you can see, I just had it as an array, it's going to derive uh, the annotation data that we would have had inside of each one of these classes and auto-generate it for us. And all we're really doing is uh, passing in uh, an ID, a label, and then a color, and going ahead and returning that is here are all my derivatives. And going back to the original plugin, it's just reading that data in through the plugin definition. So my derivative class is providing the values for the, for the plugin definition of all of these child plugins. So just with this one class, I'm able to do multiple things. Um, I'll hop back over to the image style blah and add in a uh, colorized to hot pink. So here again we have colorized to lime, colorized to hot pink, and this is coming through through the derivatives, which is again a for a glorified for each loop. And I'll say I want this hot pink. And there we have now a hot pink pixelized image. So update the style, let's come back over here. Now we have a pinkish pixelized Mario. Cool. So jumping into something simpler, something very common, is how to define a block. And many of you have defined blocks before with hook block info, hook block view, and hook block, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is all the code that's necessary to define a block. And again, following the same patterns. It uses annotations uh, to discover where all these plugins are and what they do. Um, all it needs is an ID, an admin label, 
And then again, you know, really just extending the block base and then whatever it is that you're doing, your, I guess your, your custom logic, you can just override the methods that are necessary. In this case, in the method uh, build, I'm just providing a little snowman um, in the markup. And so if we jump into the uh, block layout and say, I'm going to drop the, where is the snowman? There you go. Add in an instance of the snowman. Uh, if I had implemented some configuration, I can go ahead and drop that in. I did not. I'll go ahead and save this and put it inside of the contents of the page. So save that, and there's my block. I think that's saved, not sure. If I come back over here, boom, we have an indifferent snowman on the page now. So very, very easy to implement a block. Cool stuff. So yeah, those are some examples of how you can implement plugins. Okay. All right, we did this already. Yes. So now for the uh, the even drier section of <laughs> <laughs> plugin system internals. Okay. So if you are a developer who wants to define some new systems, um, this would be important to you. Um, basically, everything that is uh, managing a plugin system is a plugin manager. And uh, the responsibilities of this plugin manager are um, basically it's a twofold. Uh, first off, you want to find where all your plugins exist, where all the other modules are providing these plugins, and then you want to instantiate them. So essentially the discovery phase and the factory phase. Um, and then there's also an optional phase uh, called the mapper, which would be if for whatever reason at runtime um, you don't know what you want to call. So you need some sort of mechanism that says, hey, dynamic data, come here, let me figure out what you want to do, and then I can find what, what class I'm supposed to be instantiating and go ahead and pass that to you. Uh, and that is what the mapper does. So um, first off, the discovery classes that are, you know, that are provided in Drupal uh, for the, uh, the plugin manager, um, all it's really implementing is get definition and get definitions. Um, so in a sense, this is finding all of the plugins that exist and it has very different mechanisms to do this. And I'll talk about each one of those. Uh, again, the factory is just, it's a, it's a way of instantiating. So the only method that it implements is the create instance, where we provide what the plugin ID is, and then we can provide a state as well, the configuration. And then the mapper is get instance, whereas I don't know what the instance is, but here's some configuration, here's some options, you figure it out. And then come back to me and give it to the factory so then I could create the instance and go to town with it. So. The plugin manager, all encompassing, is really just implementing each one of these interfaces. So now you have to just deal with one class, not necessarily three different classes. Um, so for instance, you instantiated a mapper, or uh, sorry, you instantiated a manager, um, and you're saying, hey, get all the definitions. Uh, the plugin manager itself doesn't have to uh, re-implement what get definitions means. Uh, instead, you can just assign the discovery property within it to a discovery class and just kind of proxy the get definitions itself. So when I say manager get definitions, really what it's doing is calling the discovery class to get the definitions for it and just passing that along. The discovery classes that are available um, are static discovery, which is, hey, I'm just gonna give you straight up all the different plugins that I want you uh, to have, and this is kind of cool for testing. So you don't have to implement plugins, you just say, here's an array of data, go to town. Uh, YAML discovery, which is what you often see with uh, well, basically every YAML file uh, that is in Drupal. Uh, menu links, menu routers, uh, contextual menus, um, services themselves, et cetera, et cetera. Those are essentially uh, providing data for plugins. And the way the systems will find them is by looking through all the YAML files. And uh, hook discovery, which is what we're all used to, is something hook info. And at this point, I'm not even sure if that's available anymore. I haven't checked. Um, that might have been deprecated, I'm not sure, but hey. But the most common one is the annotation discovery, which is where we put in these annotations uh, baked into our classes, um, and that's what uh, most people are doing, and it looks really cool, so maybe that's the method that you want to try. So um, what does it look like when you're actually pulling in this data? Inside of the constructor for your uh, plugin manager, uh, you can do this. Say the discovery property, it's going to be an annotated class discovery. Um, how do I find this stuff? Well, the first parameter is here's the subdirectory that you should be looking in for the namespace. And here's a list of all the namespaces you should be looking at. Uh, essentially, this is all the modules that are enabled. And then um, 
how do I know which marker I should be looking for? Well, that's where you would have to implement an annotation class, um, and you just specify what the namespace is for that. So Drupal core annotations actions, in this case, would be looking for anything with an at action uh, marker inside of the doc blocks, and assuming it's within a certain namespace, bam, it finds all the plugins. So again, this is what differentiates the standard class as being a standard class or a plugin that can be used. Uh, hook discovery, um, this is basically invoking a module invoke. So um, if I'm saying, hey, here are all the modules that exist, and I'm invoking element info, it's basically calling out hook element info or looking for everything that implements that. So that's something that you're very familiar with. Uh, YAML discovery, um, this is the file name that you want to look for. And again, these are all the modules that are enabled. So look through all those directories and grab all the stuff. And then static directory, uh, st static discovery, which is again just passing in an array. Uh, only really useful for testing. And uh, on top of the existing discovery classes, there's something called decorators, which is a lot like uh, alter hooks. Um, we'll jump into each one of these. So uh, derivative discovery decorator, which is supposed to be trying to remember. Ah, for every uh, plugin type that you define, uh, if your plugins are providing a derivative class within the annotations, it'll go ahead and pull in those classes and find all the sub or child plugins that exist for that plugin. So if you needed that or wanted to provide that functionality inside the constructor of the plugin manager, you would pass this in. Uh, alter decorator, again, this is invoking something that's very familiar to most of us, uh, which is calling out hook action info alter or whatever hook that you pass in. Uh, for the discovery. And then a process decorator would be something like, uh, hey, I have all the plugins that I want, even through the, uh, the, the discovery decorators. Now I want to process each one of these hooks to provide some defaults or maybe massage the data a little bit. And I want you to call this callback to be responsible for doing that. Um, this is where you would provide that. And then a cache decorator, which is a kind of interesting way of thinking of this. Um, if we're passing in all of the plugins that have been discovered, how do we cache them? Uh, we can patch that in through this discovery or decorator, uh, which is a cache. And instead of pulling in plugins directly from Drupal source code, um, it would just pull it in directly from cache. So here you define what your cache key is, and uh, it would be in charge of just caching that on the fly as it's discovering it. So all of these, I guess, processes to, to, to find plugins or even to find things that are defined in like uh, info hooks. Uh, something that you've all been familiar with, but now we have uh, classes uh, that basically walk us through the process uh, without us having to do much. So that's the discovery phase. Now the factory classes. Um, what we have available are just the default factory, uh, container factory, reflection, and widget factory. And in a sense, what this looks like when you're implementing it is you call the plugin manager and say, hey, create the instance. Here's the plugin ID that I want because now that I've discovered all the plugins, I have machine names. And I'm going to pass this plugin ID and pass in some state based on whatever my application is doing. Um, I, I look at it in terms of this. When you instantiate a class, it kind of, it's broken down into two pieces. How you instantiate something and then the arguments that you pass into it. Um, given that kind of context, uh, now all the plugin factories that exist uh, or factory plugins that exist uh, kind of make more sense. For instance, the default factory, uh, this is literally just calling new whatever the class name is. So um, that's a pretty straightforward operation. And passing in the fixed arguments that you, uh, that you require in your plugin type. So that's very simple. But if you want to do something different, like instantiate your plugins with the container factory, just like we talked about with the service containers, uh, there's a class for that. And internally, this is what it would be calling in. The plugin class create method and just pulling in the Drupal container uh, object in which we can then you know, grab in the ID that we want and pass in some state into that. So yet again, a, a different way of instantiating this plugin. Uh, the widget factory is something that's used with the field widgets. Uh, in a sense, uh, if you ever needed to have uh, an instantiator with custom uh, parameters, um, this would be, a, a, I guess, a nice way to follow suit. Uh, where in this case, uh, it's not just pulling in the config plugin and the plugin definition. Instead, it's passing in the field definitions and then the config settings. So it's, it's doing its own thing here. Um, not necessarily useful probably for your own custom code to you know, extend upon it, but it is a good example to see how um, you can, I guess, have a different way of instantiating with uh, custom parameters. And uh, the reflection factory, which is actually pretty interesting. Um, 
the dynamic part here is that instead of having a fixed set of arguments, uh, it's a dynamic set. So a reflection class would basically pull in um, the class and find out what arguments exist for it in the, the function signature. And uh, based on what you pass in as configuration, it would go ahead and pull in these IDs into the uh, parameter or into the, uh, the plugin itself dynamically. Um, and this is kind of helpful for any kind of plugin that you have an X number of parameters that can be coming in. Um, this is especially used in something like uh, autocomplete, where you can have N number of parameters being passed in, or even in, uh, I think, entity relations, where you can have, again, different parameters to define like what these relationships are. So reflection factory is really good for that, dynamic arguments. And then the mapper class, which is the optional part, getting the instance. Um, the way this works is that you're not really defining which class you're instantiating, nor are you defining what arguments to pass in, but you do have a set of options based on, I don't know, the state of your application. Um, what it will do is it'll grab in some options and it'll go through some logic phase that say, hey, figure out what class would be most appropriate to do the process that I want to do. Uh, one example would be the archiver, where there's many different mechanisms to archive something, uh, zip or targz. Um, how do we know which one to use? Uh, based on configurations that we're passing in, it would decide what class is most appropriate to handle such a thing. So for instance, um, looking at the extension of a file, then it would know, oh, you know, this is a .zip file, so I'm gonna use the zip on archiver. Another example of this would be, um, say for instance, you have a REST server, and you wanna process basically the response of a request. Um, at runtime, you don't know what class is most appropriate, but you can look at the, the content type that the requester is accepting, and you can say, hey, you know, this guy wants to have JSON format, so let's pull in the JSON class. And this will happen on runtime, so you don't necessarily have to have strange if-else conditions uh, inside your application. Um, the mapper class should be able to handle that instead. So once it has a logic and figures out what it needs, it figures out what the plugin ID is, and then you can just pass that into the factory. So this create instance, now I have the ID. And again, you can pass in the options to define whatever configurations you need thereafter. Um, so that is, in a nut, all you really need. Ah, I went back too far. Too many concepts. Okay. That is all a plugin manager is. Um, but again, keep in mind this is headless. Um, you're basically pulling in plug-in data, so once you have that data, it's up to you if you wanted to have some sort of interface that goes along with it. And again, that's the fancy part that you can decide what you want to do with. Um, and then, of course, the instantiation, which is a very boring and simple thing, but again, there's you know different mechanisms of doing it based on certain use cases. Um, and whatever's part of a Drupal uh, pretty much helps you get there at least half of the way. So uh, I'll go ahead and create a demo of uh, doing a plug-in manager. Um, in a sense, this is what the relationships look like. We have a, uh, a person plugin manager, which is the fictional plugin type that I've created, which is a really lame example. Um, it's extending the default plugin manager, and that itself is implementing a lot of interfaces in which you can see in the green dotted lines. It implements the mapper interface, factory interface, and discovery interface, of course. Um, and then it also implements the plugin manager base itself. So it has now a contract in which there's a certain number of uh, methods that the plugin manager is supposed to implement. Uh, luckily, the default plugin manager handles almost all of them. And uh, the person plugin manager really only needs to add in additional things uh, that the default plugin manager does not provide, such as a cache backend if I wanted to, or alter hooks if that's what I wanted to do as well. So when you define your own plugin types, there's really not a whole lot of custom code you have to write, but there is a bit of boilerplate stuff that you'll need to do. Um, so let's drop into code again. And we'll talk about each one of these. All right. So it starts off with a first in plugin manager. Actually, let's take a step back. I'm defining a system in which I have a plugin type that's supposed to do certain operations. In this case, it's just something simple like get a person, and there's really only three parameters in which I play with. A person's name, uh, their age, and then how they do their greeting, uh, assuming they're like multilingual or whatever. Um, so this is the interface in which all the plugins will, uh, would basically extend. Um, I will provide a person base, which is a class, and again, these classes don't necessarily have to exist in any specific place. You define what these namespaces are. Um, but in here, in this case, I'm just using Drupal Pilot plugin because that's a bit intuitive. 
Um, my class person base is extending the plugin base, which again provides a lot of other stuff for us. But I'm implementing the person interface. So again, this is what differentiates a class from a plugin type is that it's implementing a specific interface. And here I'm just providing the defaults. Get name, it's just going to grab the definition and grab the name property. Get age, I'm grabbing it from the definition, grabbing the age property. And then the greeting, simple. Hello, my name is this, and I am this many years old. So very, very straightforward. So that defines, I guess, the skeleton of what my plugins would look like. Now I need to define a manager to basically handle doing the discoverability of these plugins and all the instantiating of these plugins. So now I jump into the person plugin manager PHP file. So this is now three files that we're working with. Um, again, I'm providing the namespace Drupal pilot plugin because that's intuitive. All of this use stuff is just uh, as a shortcut for not having to define the classes uh, over and over again. But in my person plugin manager, I'm extending the default plugin manager, which itself is in charge of uh, really pulling in uh, or uh, implementing a lot of the methods that are that are necessary uh, since we are uh, extending or implementing a certain interface. So that handles a lot of it. Um, I'll go ahead and move this over so we can see more of the code as possible. Um, Normally, all you would want to do is just call the parent constructor, which is a default plugin manager, which does a lot of stuff to it. Uh, we pass in what sub namespace we are expecting our plugins to exist in. So in this case, plugin person. Um, the namespace that's passed in, uh, which is all the different modules that are enabled at the time, where are all the different places where I can find plugins. Uh, module handler, which is just a boilerplate, uh, describes all the different modules that exist. Um, and in this case, um, something that is special, I am using annotations uh, to, to find all my plugin types. So I'm saying, hey, where is my annotation classes? Uh, internally, so it's not so opaque as to what's happening, uh, the default plugin manager is doing this. It's defining a discovery property, and it's setting that to the annotation discovery. And so this is where the, the sub namespace and the annotation path uh, actually goes to work. Um, it'll find all of the markers that have at person um, under this directory using that class. And then I'm again reassigning discovery, but this time passing it through a derivative discovery decorator. In this case, it's a container derivative discovery decorator in which uh, if I had any person classes that defined a, uh, a derivative uh, class in itself, it can go ahead and spawn child plugins. Um, and then uh, I'm defining the, uh, the factory, uh, which is just a default container factory. You don't have to do anything special. And then also just providing the module handler. Uh, but this is what the default plugin manager does, um, just for visibility. But in a sense, this is all I really had to do. The only custom parts that I wanted for myself is I wanted to provide an ability to have a hook pilot person info uh, to be invoked. So I can go ahead and change up the info uh, if I had another module that wanted to do that. So this is where I would invoke that. And since I wanted this stuff cached in the back end, I'll go ahead and implement this set cache back end uh, and provide a, a cache key in there itself. So that is a plugin type. That is a manager. And that's essentially on all I need to do. All the heavy lifting is really provided through the default plugin manager to, to get all the definitions, to instantiate the definitions, or instantiate the plugins, rather. But I did mention something about annotations, a custom annotation. So there's one extra thing that we have to do. Uh, inside of our source directory, uh, we have annotations uh, and then a person.php class. And this is very, very simple, where we're extending the, uh, the plugin annotation. And this is where we define what our default parameters would be for, like, I guess the hook info, what we're all used to. And in this case, I'm just looking for an ID, a name, and an age, um, and providing some defaults also in here. And with this, now I can use Doctrine to basically find uh, all of the classes uh, or all of my plugins uh, looking for that at person uh, marker inside of the code. And uh, one last thing is that since we provided a, a plugin manager and this is itself a, a global service in which we can use globally, we uh, basically register it as a service. Um, so I give it the machine name of plugin.manager.pilot.person. Right? I say where the class is and I define basically what my arguments are, but I don't necessarily have to redefine what my arguments are, I can just reference the parents, which is the default plugin manager, and so we'll use whatever it defined as its arguments. So I don't have to do anything other than just say, hey, here's my parents, and whatever arguments you pass to it, I want you to pass it to me.
So those are all the four components that we need to actually generate this. Um, in this module, I'm providing person plugins. So this is what other modules would be doing. Um, essentially, the, the annotation portion of this, at person, I'm defining the ID, the name, and the age. And I'm not necessarily doing anything within the, the class itself because the defaults are fine. The defaults that I'm putting in the person base are just completely fine, for Bob at least. For Dave, Dave is going to say something a little different. Say, hey, my name is this. But again, the whole idea of having your, uh, your, your plugins parameterized and having all your info baked in together is all right here through the annotations. So we have those two plugins. Um, other modules can pr provide their own plugins as well. And uh, to actually pull this in, uh, we'll look at a form that I have, which does the collection of these things. So we'll get this stuff out of the way. All right, so given that now we have the class for the plugin manager and all the additional boilerplate stuff that was necessary, uh, we can now actually use the plugin manager using a, a service container. So I'm saying, hey, I want the manager and grab that from the Drupal service container. Here's the machine name that I defined within the, uh, the, the services.yaml file. Um, with that, it would figure out all the different classes that it needs to instantiate um, and do its whole dependency injection thing, <coughs> in which case it would basically instantiate the class for me. So now this is a manager class, the plugin manager that I've created. Uh, I want to collect all of the plugins, so I say, hey, manager, get all the definitions. And here I'm just you know, printing R all of these onto the page. And I want to pull in an instance specifically. So um, in this case, you would probably want to do something fancy, like a UI, uh, where a user can click through things or whatnot, and you have a list of uh, all these plugins in which you could probably attach configurations to them or whatever. But once your logic defines what, which uh, plugin you want to load in, uh, you can go ahead and just create the instance and pass in the machine name that you want. And now that we have the instance, the actual plugin type with you know, optional configurations within it, we can do stuff with it. In this case, I'm just calling out the greeting. So it's going to say, hello, my name is whatever. Um, and that is all. So let's navigate to the page that's providing that. And that is, I lost it. Router. All right, so in this second, <laughs> I was able to discover where all my plugins are through annotations. I was also given the opportunity to uh, have derivatives, child plugins, for everything that's instantiated or everything that's defined as a plugin of person. And in the end, I'm really just collecting it and caching it, and now I'm just displaying it right here, in which I've only found two plugins, Bob and Dave, and you have all the plugin definitions in here. Uh, secondly, if you remember, <clears throat> I pulled in an instance, a specific instance, Bob, and I'm just saying, get the greeting from Bob. So come back over here, and I'm printing that out itself. Hello, my name is Bob, and I'm 26 years old. And I pulled in that data from the annotations that I uh, defined. Um, so again, this is very, very simple, uh, and boiled down to its simplicity, in which now you can define like what your UI would look like, or what your business logic or what the purpose of your system is to pull in this data, but now you're pulling in these classes, figuring out a way of which to pull in like which specific plugin ID, and then doing stuff with it. So it's up to you to decide what it is you're going to do. So very simple stuff. Three lines, and I was able to have a plugin system, or at least actually working with it. So yeah, play. So my final thoughts. <clears throat> There's a lot of um, implication that comes in with plugin types, um, or just building plugins in general. And uh, a lot of it is, at least through my eyes, uh, a way of segmenting out operations, functionalities, into their own little silos in which they belong. It's really easy to have any different opportunity to, uh, to, to drop in code and do stuff with. For instance, hook, you know, or hook page uh, preprocess page, or, or hook page alter, or whatnot. And, uh, it gets pretty crazy in which all the opportunities you have to do some really wild stuff. And uh, it becomes unmanageable. And it becomes very far away from, I guess, the metaphor of life and how we think of things. 
Um, when you think of how certain operations in life can be separated out into smaller segments, into their own little silos, you can swap out uh, actual mechanisms to do things. And your code should actually follow suit as much as possible to real life metaphors. Um, I think that would keep you more aligned with the reality of writing code and doing things that are more, I guess, uh, friendly for the, the product owners or just the, the way a system works. Um, and again, plugins just kind of follow uh, a certain best practice that encourage you to do better code and not necessarily just like mash things together. I envision a lot of the development moving forward to be not just using like a big blob of custom code in your site, but really just abstracting as much as possible very specific operations into plugin types in which then you can uh, nurture, in which you can then extend upon. Because you'll have these different instances, the same code used over and over again, and now you have more eyes and more use cases on it in which you can discover bugs and really put more care into the code that you put in. Uh, so I feel this is a good uh, kind of segue into uh, a happy <laughs> way of coding, or at least a, a better work-life balance in a sense when you think about it. So um, anyway, uh, that was me. Um, please evaluate this session. Um, there's a link at the very bottom um, for you to do so. Um, and if there's any time, I'll go ahead and take any questions now. Thank you. Uh, I, this this might be a, a little rudimentary, uh, given the depth that you just covered in this subject. I'm, I'm honestly not. I'm still not sure I get quite what an interface is or what it's meant to accomplish. Yeah. So in Drupal 7, um, it's all functional, which means that there's no contract in which a certain uh, function has to do something. Uh, there's no guarantee as what the input or what the output is, other than the arguments that are passed in. But with an interface, a PHP class interface, you define what are required uh, methods that a class needs to implement. So anything that is implementing an interface, if you don't have those methods within it, uh, PHP will fail. And it'll say, no, there's an error. We cannot process because the method that is supposed to be implementing this interface is not doing its contractual agreement. So this would include the parameters that you pass in, the type of parameters you pass in, um, and then also uh, just the existence of the methods. So that is how a method or a class can uh, uh, implement an interface by providing the methods and also ensuring that the arguments that it's accepting are the same that the interface had defined. Thank you. Thanks for this wonderful talk. Um, it was really great to get an uh, in-depth discussion of plugins and see how they operate. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, I feel like I'm still trying to wrap my head around like what the um, architectural reason for using annotations is. Um, it seems like we're taking comments and now using them almost like properties on, on objects or like static uh, variables. I'm just trying to understand why we would start using comments in what seem to be almost almost like we're doing the programming in the comments. Yes. So if you could elaborate on that, I'd appreciate yes. it. Yes. So when, when it's, not, it's not code inside of the annotations. It's kind of like saying, oh, we have YAML files now, and we have code inside of YAML files, which is not necessarily the case. It's all declarative. Basically provide a value and a key, um, and that's all annotations are doing. Uh, why use those? Uh, because it's baked into the class. It's a convenience. Um, but maybe it does make it harder to debug because where are these values coming from? And I have to dig deep into like what Doctrine is doing to grab that data. But you don't have to use annotations. It's completely optional. You could continue using info hooks. Uh, hopefully they're not deprecated at this point. I haven't checked. Uh, but there are different mechanisms of discovery. Annotations is just one of them and one of the more popular ones. The, um, the slide link, or the link that's in that slide in particular, uh, has a, a, another slide deck that describes why annotations are, are, are useful um, and kind of defends both sides of the argument. So looking into that would probably uh, lighten things up. Thank you. Hello, Helior. Thank you for giving this talk. I, uh, I watched a YouTube video you have given a talk in a different camp, and uh, this is a much better version really? of, of the presentation. This is great. I was I was um, bored talking, actually. <laughs> I'm, I'm conflicted, though. Um, I, I could see plugins as a solution being a great solution for plugging into an existing bit of architecture. 
so things like file from uh, field formatters and blocks and th things like that. What I'm not getting is the cross section between using a plugin for the solution and using an entity for that same kind solving that same kind of problem. Can you explain like where it conflicts with entities and how to s resolve that problem? There's a lot of uh, overlap actually with uh, config entities and um, entities in a sense are basically a collection of configuration and it would use plugins to do things with it. Right, so think of plugins as being the operational part of things to do singular actions, to process data, to do stuff, but doesn't actually hold data. If anything, these plugins could have configuration that modify how it does things, but it doesn't necessarily store a node. It doesn't persist any kind of entity. And you can think of entities as being basically like, if it has a, a table record, right, if there's a row inside the database, then it would be an entity. But plugins don't necessarily operate that way. Uh, so for me, that is the distinction between where plugins uh, work, processing data, and entities would be basically persisting data and having like you know load functions and the whole CRUD stack that's baked into that and everything else that goes along with it. That helped. Yeah, that that, that helped a bit. But that makes blocks more confusing. <laughs> yes, it does. I can kind of help clarify that if if that helps a little bit um, with an example. Uh -huh. Is that okay? Uh -huh. um, so uh, think about views. In the Views UI, you assemble, you take a bunch of different filters and a bunch of different fields, and you have several displays in the view, and you put them all together to make one thing, right? So each of those individual little things, each kind of filter that you add is defined by a plugin. The plugin contains the metadata about it, a definition of what the thing is, and then an API for how to, how to do the thing. But what it doesn't contain is what you just configured in your view. And so what happens when you c configure a view is that the specific instances, the specific configuration data from many different plugins is saved in one configuration entity. So the entity is ac essentially just providing the storage for the thing that you just configured. Similarly with blocks. Um, if I have like a, you know, his snowman block. I thought that was a very cute example, by the way. Um, if I have a snowman block, that, that doesn't actually create a block on my site. What that does is it says, hey, block API, I have this block available. Use it how you see fit as the block API. And then what, where the entity part of that comes in is when you are configuring an, a site and you place an instance of that block somewhere. So you're, you're not actually, the, the instance of the block is, you can have many of them, right, in Drupal 8. That's one of the, the new pieces of functionality that's available. So you can take your snowman block and you can put it in the header and you can put it in the footer and you can put five of them in the sidebar if you want to and configure spe specific things with each of those. Then those block instances would be stored as configuration entities and the configuration system would be deployed to other sites or whatever. So that's where the distinction is. Entities are about data, whereas the plugin is about defining an API for something and the way, the way in which you can create things. It's not necessarily coupled, but that's how the two interact frequently in, in core. So would it be fair to say that the only responsibility a plugin has in regards to entities is creating their instances? And then whatever, however that entity stores its configuration, if it's a content entity or, or a configuration entity, it does what it does. We need to take this conversation outside so we can... Oh, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> yeah. That's why specifically I didn't want to talk about configuration entities because... Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I had a question about when you're instantiating um, a plugin type, um, the annotation, is there a, like, does something tell you if your syntax isn't correct or does it just fail silently? Uh, specifically where? Like when your annotation is incorrect, like with the curly braces or, you know, within like the comments ah, about it. Yeah. So Instead uh, of like a hook block info, mm -hmm. you have like mm -hmm. your annotation. Yeah, because a doctrine does its own processing. It's, it's parsing the string and it does its own thing. So in there it has its own validators and you'll get errors saying, hey, this is not formatted correctly. You're missing a comma or maybe you have this other thing that's not closed out. So it will do that for you through all the errors and whatnot. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Cool, thank you guys.